Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NAI Director Seminar. I just heard an open mic, which I'm pretty sure wasn't Steve, so you might just want to check your mics. I am very, very pleased that Steve Benner is here to give the NAI Director Seminar this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Steve's group at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, which is a foundation that he began, is addressing some of the most profound questions in understanding our nature of life. And in particular, the question that Steve's group is addressing is what's required of life in that it couldn't have been any other way, and what's contingent in that it could have been lots of other ways. And Steve, as a chemist, is approaching this through synthetic biology, which is a field which Steve has, and his colleagues have been a pioneer in developing. In particular, what they have done is to use organic chemical synthesis to prepare artificial genetic systems and then actually operate those systems to produce proteins that have amino acids other than the amino acids that are normally used by proteins. And they're applying these in a wide variety of areas, including addressing <laughs> you okay, Steve? <laughs> Including addressing the big questions, and also in areas such as personalized medicine, where they are working on uh, developing ways of treating individuals based on the individual's own genetic makeup. So we are really, really privileged to have Steve with us today to give the talk. Steve has both a bachelor's and a master's in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale and a PhD in chemistry from Harvard. And he will be speaking with us today on four general approaches. I forget the exact title here. I know I have it. Four general approaches to the nature of life is probably close enough. Steve, I will just turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Carl. Um, Feel free. I'm not sure how these conferencing systems work, but if you have an opportunity to interrupt me um, and ask a question as we go through this talk, feel feel free to do so. Um, I, I guess you are looking at my first slide, what is life? Would that be correct? Is that someplace in front of you? Yes, it is. Okay, excellent. Um, and this, of course, is a question that um, is both provocative and central as the part of the problem. Um, uh, just uh, so that I now have advanced the slides to the next one. Correct. All is working. Okay, excellent. So uh, you got to keep in mind that about uh, five years ago, John Barris and I, uh, well, John Barris persuaded me to join this uh, committee that was put together by the National Research Council to talk about the limits of organic life and planetary systems. It was actually commissioned by NASA, and the National Research Council put... Uh, various people together, some of whom I guess are in attendance here, and you can see your names listed. One of the things that the committee decided not to do at the outset was to decide not to try to define life. Um, I thought that was a bit cowardly myself, because uh, if you're going to argue about the limits of life, you at least have to have some um, criteria for what a definition of life would be. Um, but then Carol Cleland got involved in the organization peripherally, and she, her point, of course, was that in order to define life, you actually have to have a theory of life. And in fact, if you talk to any of these philosophers long enough, you can get to see the comment, which I think is on the bottom of the, uh, of the first slide, which is that, uh, let me just go make sure I have this zoom to fit on my screen, which is actually when you talk to a philosopher long enough, they will persuade you that you don't even know how to define definition. I mean, you don't even know how to define water, and that's one of the things that philosopher has have done to us. So very much what you talk about is very much connected to what you think is possible and what you might think actually exists. Um, and that, of course, in itself is driven by theory, and the theory may or may not be complete. In fact, we know from the history of science that many times of the theories that we thought were quite reliable on which we were making constructive actions turn out to be not true at all. So one of the things that we would like to do is not have a definition that is just a laundry list of the attributes of known living systems. And I, I pulled the, the list here out of a textbook, you know, the ability to reproduce, the ability to utilize energy, that you excrete waste, that you move, or you have the ability to respond to external stimuli. It's all a laundry list of attributes. It's not really much of a definition. 
Um, that's not because biology doesn't have definitions, and some of them are now listed on this particular slide. So many of you, for example, especially if you're coming from the background of cell biology, know about the cell theory of life. There's obviously the evolutionary theory of life, there are various information theories of life, and there's various molecular theories of life. And these have operated over the last several hundred years. Certainly the cell theory of life has emerged after the microscope um, came along and therefore was able to identify a whole world of cellular life that was not visible to the naked eye. Well, so cell life theory of life is you know, certainly one that's quite popular. It's actually used, for example, when people look for life in the cosmos, certainly in NASA missions. So uh, this is actually a, 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 an older slide. This is actually from Hook, who is looking at cork cells. And in fact, he is the individual who came up with the word cell in English language because he was looking at what looked to him like small rooms or chambers, mostly in plants. Um, Schwann, of course, and Schleiden were uh, the people who actually um, looked at the unification of life um, in 1847. Actually, it was in 1840. This, this is actually an English translation of their book, which you can actually download from the History of Science Foundation in Berlin. And it's in, just in case you think that we put in the modern world a gloss on what ancient people were thinking 150 years ago, it's actually quite clear that these folks were actually trying to unify life in a theoretical sense. In fact, their whole introduction to this book is a discussion about how deplorable it is that people who study plants and people who study animals don't talk to each other. And what he's going to use is try to use the cell structure of both of these as a way of trying to unify life in some sort of a theory. Now, the fact that this is driving um, our, our idea of what constitutes life at a very fundamental level is the fact that a couple of months ago, Proto-Life announced its plans, this was last August, to create artificial life in three to five years. This has caused quite a flurry in the press, uh, uh, not, not the least of which was because people thought it was dangerous. But what did they consider? Well, they put this picture out. This is a cell structure. And indeed, when we go look for life in the, um, in the cosmos, we also look for cell structures very frequently. And this is, of course, on the right, the famous picture from the Allen Hills meteorite, which is looking at structures that look sort of cell-like. And from that, a large amount of speculation was started as to whether there might have been life that formed those. So the cell theory of life is fine, but really, the, as the debate over the Allen Hills meteorite illustrates, cell-like structures are really not definitive biosignatures, and they can be generated by many non-light living processes as well. Well, I'm not going to dwell on the second theory. It's one of my favorites, it's sort of the evolutionary theory of life. This is the animal room at the Natural History Museum in Paris, where you can see people trying to classify all forms of life that they could find on, on Earth. Upstairs from this room, you can actually find the original fossils that Cuvier was actually looking at when he came up with his first concepts of evolution. And of course, Lamarck's statue is out in front of this building. What's quite clear is that the evolutionary theory of life is, is classically defined, has really not been as successful as it could be. In particular, it really did not identify the central fact that life on Earth is monophyletic, so it doesn't actually transparently um, uh, make obvious uh, that microbial life and macroscopic life are actually related by common ancestry, even though they have cells, because of course at some point if you decide that life is a natural state and that cells are necessary for life, you're forced to this conclusion that if you have plants based on cells and animals based on cells, it could just as easily be the fact that those arose independently by conversions rather than by common ancestry. And so it really turned to molecular theories of life that, uh, to, to come up with the essential understanding of monophyleticism. You're looking just at three structures. The structure in the middle upper part of the slide is urea. This is the compound that was made in 1828 by Voller, which is what discarded anti-vitalism, uh, discarded vitalism as a theory of life. Um, the metabolism in the lower left, uh, people are arguing that this is an essential feature of life. And in fact, if you go through the laundry lists that you learn in high school biology about what life is, the ability to take in energy and to secrete waste is all part of the metabolism definition, the metabolism concept of life. And then, of course, on the right is an, one of my favorite theories of life, which is the so-called gene theory of life, which is the argument that in order to have life, you have to have a molecule that contains information that can be passed from generation to generation. 
perhaps with some errors that allow the first steps of our Darwinian evolution uh, to proceed. So that's cool. The question today and, and is a little ambitious, but the question is whether we can bring these together. Um, I actually gave a talk on the top wedge of this uh, four-part diagram uh, a couple days ago at the NASA AbSciCon, so I won't go into great detail of this. But one of our goals is to whether we can take the bottom wedge, which is really the natural history view, may be supported by molecular evolution to work backwards in time so that we can go to a simpler form of life. Now the theory here is really very, uh, very, very perhaps naive, but that is that if you go backwards in time to a simpler form of life, what will remain as you examine more and more ancient life is, is life that is more uh, essential. That is, a, a simpler form of life is uh, more reflective of what is necessary for life in general and that more derived forms of life have all the baggage of, of history superimposed upon what is essential for life and therefore make it difficult or more difficult to see what is essential for life. So one of the ideas is that maybe as we can look at the tree at the bottom of uh, the four-part diagram, you can see how you can look at the three kingdoms and maybe infer ancestral life forms and from those resurrect them maybe even for laboratory study combine them with the fossils on the right to try to come up with something more essential to life, something essential here meaning in the essence of this, something more basic. Now we, we've tried this. I mean, certainly molecular evolution is what has brought together sort of the classical evolutionary theory with the molecular evolutionary theory. For those of you who are not familiar with this, there are really three components of a molecular evolutionary analysis, especially when you deal with proteins. And I've drawn them here in the upper left-hand corner. You're looking at amino acid sequences, or at least the first 20 amino acids, of proteins from ox, from sheep, and from camel. Um, it's transparently obvious from the similarities between those three sequences that they are related by common ancestry. If you have any kind of statistical model where you propose that those sequences arose in their similarities by random chance, the chances of that happening are quite small. You can notice, of course, that the camel sequence is more different from the ox and the sheep. And the ox and the sheep differ from each other. And from that comes the second part of a phylogenetic analysis, which you see on the right, which is the evolutionary tree, which shows the familial relationships of these species, that ox and sheep diverge from each other after they both diverge as an ancestral form from camel. And, of course, the whole set diverge um, long after man split off from that lineage leading to modern ruminants. So... That's an important uh, component. The third thing, which is not as often discussed, but it's been known for, I guess, ever since Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckercandle in the 1960s proposed it, was that if you have the sequences of the descendant proteins, you can infer the sequences of the ancestral proteins. And I'm just uh, at the bottom left of this slide sh pointing to a, um, uh, uh, an evolutionary reconstruction you know, if you want to know what is the position one of this protein from ox and from in, the, in the ancestor of ox and sheep, well, the ox has a K, that's a lysine at position one. The sheep also has a K, that's a lysine also in position one. Therefore, it is most parsimonious, that is, it requires the fewest number of uh, amino acid replacements to assume that the ancestor also had a K or a lysine at position one. And so the ancestral sequence, which has a lysine in position 1, a K is in black at the bottom of that alignment. Um, e is the second amino acid. But, you know, when you get to the position 3 in the alignment, you've got a problem because ox has a T, that's a threonine, and sheep have an S, that's a serine. What are you to do? Because if you go to the tree reconstruction in the lower left, if you infer that the ancestor had a T or a threonine in position 3, then... There was one change which produced the serine in the modern sheep. In contrast, if you assume that the ancestor has a serine at position three, then there's one change in the lineage leading to modern ox that put a threonine in there. Those two inferences about the ancestral state reconstructed at position three are equally parsimonious. That is, they both require one change in the tree, and therefore... In classical analysis, um, one would not know whether to put a threonine or a serine at position 3 in the ancestral sequence. And by the way, that's true even if you're a fan of maximum likelihood uh, the, uh, analyses. You still have about a 48% chance of there being a threonine at the ancestor at that site, maybe a 47% chance that there's a serine 
and the remaining 5% of the probability is distributed all over all the other amino acids. So, never mind. Um, you live in the age of the genome. Everybody and his brother is having his genome sequence. And so if you actually look at the uh, database, you're likely to find an outgroup, in this case CAMEL, which conveniently um, has a 3 in position 3, and that resolves the ambiguity and in inference of the ancestral sequence. And so these are the, you know, the ways in which you can bring together sort of a historical um, theory uh, or historical model for life based on paleontology and the molecular structure of life um, in a productive way. Well, now... Um, now we can try to go backwards in time. We can try to understand the details of interactions between chemistry and enzymology using this. And our real goal, of course, was to try to get an experimental correlate here uh, for what we do in silico with the sequences, which you saw on the previous slide. And one of your problems is that most people think that because evolution occurred in the past, its hypotheses are intrinsically untestable and therefore essentially un unscientific. And if, and if you talk to creationists or intelligent design people, they will remind you of this at the, at the time. But um, it's not true. There are clearly predictions that can be made about future discoveries and uh, future analyses that can be made with evolutionary theory. But one of the major questions is whether we could ever get an experimental car in the laboratory to test sort of these just-so stories that molecular evolutionists, as well as their, um, their com compatriots in classical evolution, are constantly um, created. And that actually is an idea that actually goes back to Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckerkandl about 40, oh, actually closer to 50 years ago now, which was that if you can infer the sequences of ancient proteins using the process I just described to you, um, through the magic of recombinant DNA technology, you can resurrect them, you can bring them back to life in the laboratory where you can study them and therefore bring the power of experimental method to bear on the questions that relate history, function, in the ancient world in particular, to molecular structure. And of course, um, one thing is quite clear is that, as is said at the bottom of this slide, what these experiments are going to show is something that perhaps few people in this conference need to have shown to them, and that is that evolution is extremely powerful as a way, at least in modern Terran life, of getting function out of molecules. Um, and, of course, that is one of the things that supports our view that evolution, if not the defining feature of living systems, is certainly going to be a defining feature of living systems. Well, let me just take a look at uh, the, the major problem in the planet over the last 40 million years. Um, Al Gore, notwithstanding, it is not global warming. It has been global cooling. You're looking on this plot to the left, uh, the isotope ratio data that shows the decomposition or the, de the, the decline of global temperature of tens of degrees centigrade since the Eocene. Let me see if this pointer actually works. I don't know if this works. There, there's the Eocene here. So that's, this, so that's the Eocene, there's the Oligocene, there's the Miocene, there's the Pliocene. The line going up indicates a ratio of isotopes and co-precipitated chirps, and, um, which is showing the cooling of the water in which they are precipitating, as well as the ice ages, which appears here. But there are actually a couple of global cooling from a time when the planet was much, much warmer, where there were tropical rainforests pretty much everywhere in Nebraska, where there's now an open savanna or prairie, cooling in the uh, Oligocene dramatically, then cooling again in the Miocene, and of course cooling um, in the modern ages with the, the ice ages. And we have on the right an artist's rendition of sort of how this had an impact on you. You as a primate grew up evolutionarily in tropical rainforests where you had abundant vitamin C coming from fruits and vegetables. Um, you lost your ability as a result, or at least without evolutionary consequences, uh, to make vitamin C. Uh, when the planet cooled and dried, the rainforests went away, the primates who were making quite a good living in the trees, even as far north as Scandinavia, all of a sudden had their source of vitamin C as well as other things removed. And so what happened, of course, was an extinction of primates over a large range of uh, part of their range until you came along as a uh, toolmaker and able to sort of take over the planet despite the global cooling. 
Now, the global climate change should actually drive many things, and this is a word from Lynn Margulis referring to planetary biology. You're talking about the interaction between the planet and the life form. And one of the things it drove was what you could sort of see in the back of this savanna, which is the emergence of grasses. Grasses really were not present um, uh, more than in any uh, large abundance more than 40 million years ago. Um, in fact, when they shot Jurassic Park, they had a hard time getting an authentic background without grasses, which have taken over the place. But for those of you who have never eaten grass, you can you should know that the grass is about 25% um, silica. It's a low nutrition source. And one of the impacts of grasses taking over large parts of what had previously been tropical or semi-tropical forest was that it drove the emergence of a new kind of animal. And I've already mentioned them. They are the sheep, or the sheep, um, the oxen, and the camels. These are animals that uh, can actually eat grass and, and make a living at it. Well, they don't actually eat grass. What the oxen do is they collect the grass. Um, that's a low nutrition food uh, arising because of the cooling in prairies about 40 million years ago, and then, of course, really in the Miocene. After the ruminant collects the grass, they feed the grass to uh, bacteria that uh, are growing in their first stomach. And then they, of course, cough up the bacteria from time to time and chew it, which gives the classical ruminant um, physiology. And then what the ruminant does is they eat fresh bacteria. They, they feed the bacteria to digestive enzymes in the subsequent chambers of their stomachs and then in the, in the uh, small and large intestines. And uh, the key point is that this is a new lifestyle. It's something that actually only emerged in the paleontological record about 40 million years ago. Um, it's emerging at the time, or shortly before the time, that grass has become important. And it requires a new kind of digestive enzymology to support. And that's because, as many of you know, who are microbiologists, is that bacteria are terribly rich in ribonucleic acid, that is RNA. Um, the ribonucleic acid is really not present in the, in, at least in abundance in the food of other animals. And so the ox takes in about 17% of its nitrogen in the form of RNA, and therefore they need a digestive ribonuclease. They need an enzyme in the digestive tract that will break down the RNA that's coming from their new lifestyle, that is eating freshly fermenting bacteria, which is coming from a new lifestyle of eating grass, which requires bacteria and the cellulases that are in the bacteria to convert the low nutrition food into something of reasonable nutrition. So, all of a sudden, you have ribonuclease, which is shown in three ways on this slide. On the right-hand side, you can see a three-dimensional structure of this protein. Below, you see the one amino acid sequence of these proteins, or whose sequence you've already seen, at least in the first 20 letters when I was describing the trees. And then you can see the chemical mechanism, which shows how ribonuclease goes about its business of breaking RNA uh, into smaller pieces and then digesting it. Cool. Well, that's a just-so story. Okay, That's a story that says, well, the planet cooled, the grasslands emerged, animals that have ruminant digestion emerged, they seem to have... Um, enzymes that digest the grasses and they have these rumens which contain bacteria that digest the RNA that coming, that's coming out of the, uh, uh, which, 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 which contain bacteria with, that have RNA that need ribonuclease to digest. How's that? And uh, uh, the question is whether you can now make that correlation, very classical physiology to actual, um, to actual uh, chemistry. And the answer is you can, by resurrecting ancient ribonucleases. And I just put down here some species uh, uh, which look at the last four million years of ribonuclease divergence. So we have the swamp buffalo and the river buffalo and the ox, and then the elon is the outgroup. This is a non-domesticated ruminant. The ancient species called Pachy portax, whose outline is represented in that little black box at the top, is the ancestor. Now remember, no fossil corresponds exactly to a tree determined by molecular data, but it's close enough. And so you can resurrect an ancient ribonuclease from this guy who didn't live, hasn't lived for four million years and ask how the protein behaves. And the answer is, well, pretty much like the modern proteins behave. Now we have a couple of criteria to decide whether or not a modern protein has a digestive role. In fact, Whenever you resurrect an ancient protein, since you are not resurrecting the ancient organism at the same time, you have to do something in vitro um, that 
sheds light on a historical hypothesis. Here we're going to be asking when this ribonuclease became a digestive enzyme, and to do so we use much the same logic that classical evolutionary people use, which is the statement that, well, if the Tyrannosaurus rex tooth looks like it is optimum for tearing flesh, then it's a flesh eater. Here we're going to look at kinetic properties of ribonucleases, modern and resurrected. We're going to look, for example, at their stability against digestion, because remember, these are proteins that are in the digestive tract. They are enzymes that hydrolyze proteins also in the digestive tract. So one of our goals is going to be to make sure that the ancient protein, as well as the modern protein, is, is, is itself stable against digestion, which is, of course, a, a, a requirement for a protein to be digested. We also look at its ability to look at many different substrates. In the digestive tract, you have to take almost all RNA sequences. Um, there are certain things that a digestive enzyme does not have to do, and that's listed at the bottom of this slide. It does not need to digest double-stranded RNA. It does not need to bind to double-stranded nucleic acids of any kind. But we're going to look at the ancient protein and say, if it behaves like a digestive enzyme, being stable itself against digestion, and having a broad substrate specificity but not interacting with double-stranded nucleic acids, then it was a digestive enzyme, and that's sort of where we go with this. Well, what's kind of amusing is that digestive behavior in ribonuclease is, in fact, found back to Archaeomerics, which is this fellow over here on the left, right, and over all this tree. In fact, if you look at on the right-hand side of this tree, you'll see all sorts of animals, all of which are ruminants, all of which chew their cud, all of them are descended from an ancestor ruminant, which is represented by the lowercase number g in this tree, lived about 35 million years ago. He was probably a ruminant as well, but the point was that his ribonuclease, as resurrected in the laboratory, extinct now for 35 million years, behaves in the laboratory like a digestive enzyme should. It stable itself to digestion, it acts on digestive substrates, and it does not act on non-digestive substrates. Is that clear? So what we're doing here is just, you know, making sort of the, the, the groundwork. It turns out that what I've just said to you is different the minute you go farther back in time. That is, if you go back to Diacodexis, which is this little fellow with a fossil here on the left of the slide, this guy is uh, um, not a ruminant as far as we can tell. He's actually coming up in the Eocene. He's a ancestor of presumably not only the classical ruminants, but also the camels, <laughs> and, um, and maybe even the pig and the hippopotamus. The point is that the resurrected ancestral protein is not a digestive enzyme. It does not act on non-digestive, sorry, it does not act on digestive subjects. It's not itself particularly stable to digestion, but it is actually, curious enough, about 10 times more active on non-digestive substrates. There's a whole story about what that enzyme was doing back in that organism, but it was not digestion. So, okay, so fair enough. That's a way in which we play to, to, uh, to uh, show how effective evolution is to manage, in this case, global cooling. Um, you know, it's not getting us all that far back in time to a more essential or a life form that is more representative of the essence of life. In fact, the diacodexis doesn't look... Well, he looks like half sheep and half pig, but uh, he's not in any sense primitive. To get something primitive by this strategy of going backwards in time, we've got to go back a lot farther. And for this, we have uh, had a marvelous collaboration with Eric Gaucher, who's also here at the Foundation. Um, we looked at elongation factors, and it's a, it's a great protein because, as many of you know, there's a structure, but it happens to be present all over in all sorts of life forms, all three kingdoms of life. It was present um, uh, in the last common ancestor. It is used to assist delivering of charged transfer RNA to the ribosome. And we can therefore, because it's everywhere and because it's highly conserved, we can infer the sequences of the ancient elongation factors from its descendants. We also have an in vitro assay, as I mentioned. In order to, when you resurrect something ancient, you're not going to have the ancient organism as a context, but at least following the idea that the, the, the present is the key to the past, it's true that the temperature that the elongation factors work optimally in modern bacteria are the temperatures at which those bacteria live. 
I mean, just to show you an example of that, this isn't a GTP binding assay for the elongation factor isolated from E. coli, which is living in your gut comfortably at 37 degrees centigrade. The enzyme, the elongation factor, works best at 37 degrees. That's what the maximum of this plot means. Um, that's the temperature where it lives. And of course, if you go to thermos, which is living at 65 degrees, and isolate the elongation factor from that, it has a max, as we did, the maximum binding temperature is about 65 degrees as well. So that means that if you have a, the ability to get into your hands the elongation factor from any ancient bacteria that you're interested in, you have the ability to infer the temperature at which that ancient bacterium lived. And um, Eric and uh, Mike and a few other people working in the lab went back and did that. Keep in mind there's an enormous amount of ambiguity in the trees that you infer for in this particular case, we only were able to go back as far as deep into the eubacterial tree, and then there's all sorts of questions about where aquifex trees, and there's all sorts of issues. But we looked at a couple of trees, and we sampled a couple of sequences to represent the ambiguity. The idea here is to try to determine whether the interpretation of the result, that is the temperature optimum, is ambiguous with respect to the ambiguity in the evolutionary model, or conversely, to try to determine whether or not the inference, in this particular case, that the ancestral bacterium lived at 65 degrees is robust with respect to ambiguities in the trees, the inferred ancestral sequences, and the like. And so the green line was with one tree, you can read the paper, um, uh, which we call PSA. The blue line was a different tree, MLSA, and um, the, uh, the uh, 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 result was quite the same. The ancestral protein had a temperature optimum also at 65 degrees centigrade, indicating that at least for the part of the tree that we have sampled, uh, oh, I'm sorry, to be more precise, at least for the tree space that we have sampled and the ancestral sequences that we have sampled, the conclusion that the ancestor was a thermophile, but not a hyperthermophile, is reasonably robust. Well, since that time, Eric has gone back and looked at resurrected elongation factors throughout the tree. This is just extracted from a recent paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago in Nature. Um, you're looking at temperatures everywhere, and if you're interested, for example, as I mentioned at the bottom, the temperature when the plants acquired chloroplasts, it's around here somewhere, um, it's over here someplace, or when the mitochondria became an endosymbiote, you can go look at this tree and get an idea of the temperature history, at least in new bacterial lineages for which we have descendants. Well, all right, there's a big disappointment here. I mean, obviously, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm delighted to know uh, something about the temperature history of life on Earth, and to the extent to which this record made uh, by inferring the sequences of ancient proteins and bringing them back to life in the lab correlates with geological records, it's delightful. And Don Lowe and, and Paul Knauth have come up with geological statements as well about this temperature history. But of course, we're still not back to essence. Uh, as far as we can tell, in metabolism, the ancient new bacterium is, I think it's probably simpler than the modern diversity of bacteria in the modern world. But it's still reasonably complicated. It still is a fellow who is able to make proteins by translation. It still is able to, you know, do wide ranges of metabolisms. It's in no sense primitive, and it's in no sense origins. So, so while we've gone back in time, we and gotten a lot of interesting data, um, and you can review a lot of this. Um, uh, um, we aren't yet to origins. We're certainly not to essence. But never mind. We've managed to make some progress. We certainly have dealt with this so-called philosophical challenge that I mentioned a few moments ago. That most scientists really don't view historical hypotheses as being inherently non-scientific. In fact, if you talk to most molecular biologists, you don't really get the impression that they have a constructive belief in evolution, right? They, they, they'll tell you they believe in evolution, but it doesn't really influence how they carry out their professional lives. And so certainly, if you can go back and infer structures of ancient life forms from the structures of their descendants, we can come up with some of these stories, one of which I've mentioned to you. Um, I haven't mentioned some of the others that you see here. Cool. Well, all right, not much simpler, not much in essence. And so um, we certainly are prepared to go in the direction that Jerry Joyce, 
who is one of many authors of this so-called NASA definition of life as a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. We've now gotten chemistry and evolution together into our theory of life. Um, uh, by the way, we don't have cells there, um, and then it's an interesting question as to whether they belong there. But of course, you can ask the question, if it's that simple, right, the essence of life is a chemical system that can do this Darwinian game, how would you establish um, this, given that paleogenetics really cannot take us back to a truly essential life form? And that we're also, by the way, having difficulty with this top wedge, which I discussed uh, a week ago at the Abpsycon, which is that we're still flailing around trying to get the pieces of origins together in a way that ties origins with what NASA is telling us about what's out here in the left wedge. And so this gets to this, the right-hand wedge, which is sort of the remaining game in town, which, which Carl mentioned already, which is this idea of synthetic biology. And it's actually a very old tradition, and, and I mean, right now people are talking about this as being a new field. In fact, synthetic biology is not really a field. It's a research strategy that complements other research strategies that we use to understand the world around us. So people obviously use observation, and certainly biology has used observation from the origin of the species. Um, another approach is analysis, which is in some sense reductionist. It's, you know, the first thing you do with a living species is kill it, and then you take it apart. And um, that's certainly been done since the Enlightenment. It's been done in the molecular sense for the last 150, 200 years. Very, 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 very productive. But one of the things is that uh, the, the, the third approach, the third research strategy is synthesis, which is to create life. And it sort of goes by, you know, the philosophy, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich, right? I mean, synthesis says that if you really understand life, or anything else for that matter, you ought to be able to make it. Now, if you understand why, uh, you know, certain organic compounds are red dyes, you ought to be able to make a red dye. Or if you under, think that you understand why a particular compound has pharmaceutical value, you ought to be able to make a different compound which has the same pharmaceutical value. So synthesis entered chemistry in particular as a way of testing understanding um, uh, by constructing new forms of matter. It also has a special value, and it is a way of enforcing discipline upon scientists in contradiction to their human instincts, right? The human instinct is that when data are emerging that contradict your theory, you discard the data. You don't discard the theory. It's a very common uh, fact. And in some sense, it's, it's necessary because most of the data you collect that doesn't agree with your theory is an artifact that's arising because the instrument is broken or because you haven't done the, the experiment correctly. But what synthesis does is selects a put a man on the moon goal that forces scientists across uncharted grounds where they're forced to encounter and solve unscripted problems in ways that do not allow self-deceptions, and my favorite example for this is always the Mars Climate Orbiter, that is if the guidance software is metric and the hardware is English, the rocket crashes. Now, all the way out, if you look at the mission reports, you know, they were evidence, there was reason to believe something was wrong, it was put aside. What synthesis does by setting this ambitious goal is to force you not to follow your instinct. You've got to eventually have things work. And for that, synthesis guides discovery in innovation in ways that analysis cannot and my favorite quote from Paul Wunder, actually, from almost 30 years ago, is that actually, just to show you that synthesis is not a field, it's, it's a chemistry is almost a subfield within synthesis. Now, chemistry has taken tremendous advantage of that because we are able to make new forms of matter uh, through synthesis as well. I mean, imagine how much easier it would be to do geology and to test a theory of plate tectonics if you could, you know, like Hitchhiker's Guide goes to Magrathay and have them make you a new planet with a slightly different tweak that you could then study to see whether your theory held out, uh, held true. Uh, here you're looking at four structures. There are four different molecules to an organic chemist. Every one of them has meaning. I've already mentioned the one in the upper left hand left hand corner. The synthesis of urea was what led to the downfall of vitalism. Um, this molecule here, cyclooctatetrine, brand new synthesis by Vilstetter. It, it, it uh, it uh, forms the underpinnings of modern understanding of ar aromaticity, a, a feature of benzene that you were forced to learn when you took organic chemistry. I mean, this structure all the way over here is vitamin B12. It was through the attempted synthesis of that, and, and you might imagine that making that molecule was indeed putting a man on the moon. It was a difficult molecule to make. 
But the war- principles of orbital symmetry emerged from that synthesis. As scientists were dragged, kicking and screaming across uncharted territory, they encountered problems. They tried to make that molecule, and their failure to solve them with existing theory forced them to come up with new theory. Well, the same thing is for life, okay? Um, and certainly when we started going back and trying to understand the gene theory of life, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is what is the chemical structures necessary to support a gene that will then support Darwinian evolution, which will then support life. And one of the things that we made was the compound, not the left-hand compound, but the next one in. The left compound, of course, is natural DNA. What we made was natural DNA with a repeating negative charge has been replaced, replaced by a structural unit, these S double bond O, S double bond O, which is very similar in structure to the phosphates that join natural DNA, but which lack the repeating charge. And if you go back and read this article, as well as articles that followed it, um, when you replace the repeating charge in a backbone of DNA by a non-repeating unit that is otherwise hydrophilic, the molecule ceases to support molecular recognition, rule-based molecular recognition. After a point, these molecules here actually will work as small fragments, but when you get to a longer fragment, the things start to fold and you start to have non-genetic behavior. And so from this came what we call the polyelectrolyte theory of the gene. The attempt to make a DNA molecule that doesn't have a repeating charge in the backbone led to a failure. We can't, we couldn't, and of course that forced us um, to rethink what was missing in our existing theories, and from that, what was missing in our existing theory was a full understanding of why that DNA molecule or RNA has these repeating charges in the backbone. They turn out to be very important for the rule-based molecular recognition properties that are essential for inheritance, that are also essential for evolution, and that's captured under this idea of a second-generation model for DNA structure. It also provides a way for which you might look for the universal gene, not just the gene on Earth, by looking for not the basis, which we have shown and we'll show you in a minute, our variable, but by looking for the backbone repeating charge that under at least the polyelectrolyte theory of the gene is required for all genes to work. Well, cool. It's clear that other things don't require, as, as Carl mentioned in the introduction, I mean, there you are, there's your four bases. The bases under the Watson and Crick theory of the gene were central. The backbone phosphates were peripheral. Well, we now know that the backbone phosphates are quite central. The bases are actually, although they're not peripheral, are certainly less central in the sense that they can certainly be changed a lot easier. Actually, it's a good test for the students in the audience to look at those four structures. I have C, G, T, and A, but you'll notice I only have A in quotation marks. The others are not in quotation marks. And that's because the structure of A has actually already been changed from what is present in your DNA. And all the students should now mention to the person sitting next to them in authority why that structure is wrong or different. It actually is better. Um, I'll pause for two seconds. That's enough pause. And then direct your attention for those of you who didn't know the answer to this amino group down here at the bottom. That's actually not present in adenine. God made a mistake when she made this compound. She left that off. And that's why adenine and thymine forms only two hydrogen bonds, not the three hydrogen bonds that hold together a GC-based pair. Well, one of the questions, of course, is, again, you know, if you're so smart, why don't you just design a new genetic molecule? And I've already told you that we failed once. We're not smart enough to design a genetic molecule where the repeating negative charge has been removed. But we turned out to be able to design um, a uh, new genetic system where we've shuffled around the hydrogen bond donors and acceptor groups. Let me just point out the Watson-Crick rules for those of you who are, are students, right? Um, the Watson-Crick based pairing rule is following this two rules of complementarity. One is a size complementarity principle, that is that large things pair with small things, a big purine pairs with a small pyrimidine. The other rule is that hydrogen bond donors, which I have here as these red hydrogens, pair with hydrogen bond acceptors, which I have as the blue nitrogens and oxygen. So C, as a small thing, presenting a hydrogen bond red, blue, blue, that's a hydrogen bond donor, acceptor, acceptor. Pairs with G, a big thing, having a hydrogen bond acceptor, donor, donor, blue, red, red. And that is how you get two base pairs, obviously A and T, even with the amino group down here at the bottom, 
have the same size complementarity. It's just the hydrogen bond patterns are different. And with T, it's blue, red, blue, and with A in this modified form, it's red, blue, red. And so that means that this big thing, A, does not pair with C, and this um, big thing, G, does not pair with T. Well, by switching around, by shuffling, um, uh, by uh, moving the red things and the blue things, the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors back and forth, you can conjecturally create a new form of genetic substance. But of course, synthesis is how you test that conjecture. And so you make all these compounds, and you discover that, yes, indeed, you can uh, make many of them. And you can do what we do in DNA synthesis, is we measure melting temperatures of DNA strands that contain funny things. I just put up a whole bunch of stuff here, which includes all of the uh, base pairs that we've made, which contain three hydrogen bonds between the big thing down here and the small thing, the big thing and the small thing. This row contains base pairs between big and small, but there are two hydrogen bonds because we leave something off at the bottom, or here we leave something off at the top, or here we leave something off at the bottom, another thing off at the bottom. Here's something joined by exactly one hydrogen bond. And we have all sorts of other structural parameters that I won't go into discussing, but you can read about in this paper that we uh, wrote uh, about five years ago with, with Ron Geyer that creates rules. So, so if you want to go back and design your own artificial genetic system, um, if these rules are correct, again, this is a synthesis proposition or a synthesis testable proposition, you ought to be able to make anything following rules. But one of the rules is that, yep, um, three hydrogen bonds is better than two, and two hydrogen bonds is better than one. That's what's shown in this particular diagram where you're looking on the left at melting temperatures of some representative samples. The red dots are melting temperatures of species. We have a base in the middle which is joined by three hydrogen bonds. The yellow dots in that diagram are uh, measuring melting temperatures of species which are, contain base pairs joined by two hydrogen bonds, and the black are either mismatches or one hydrogen bonds. And you'll discover that three hydrogen bonds is better than two, which is better than one, that it's red dots are better than yellow dots, better than black dots, even when, when you have size complementarity, that is a purine pairs with a pyrimidine, that is big pairs with small, but it's also true to some extent when big pairs with pig and um, small pairs with small. So we have some relatively stable pyrimidine pyrimidine pairing, even when you have um, a small thing paired with small thing that is not size complementary. But if you have three hydrogen bonds joining them, they, they still work pretty well. Well, that's kind of cool. Now, I'm not sure how many chemists there are on the audience, and I, I put these two slides up just in case people are interested in how you go back and do this, right? We don't get the right answers right the first time. We identify trends, we rationalize exceptions, we test hypotheses. So as I mentioned, we had a small thing paired with a small thing in a non-size complementary fashion, joined by three hydrogen bonds. But, you know, this is actually more stable than we expected it to be based on trends. And part of the reason we think that's the case is because this base has a positive charge on the nitrogen that's being indicated here. And a nitrogen with a positive charge seems to be good in the, the stacking of a base pair. It turns out that if you put a negative charge, as we have here on this red, blue, red thing, it's less stable. And um, from that, you come up with this rule that you're not allowed to have an anion or negative charge in the nucleobase stack, even though you can have a positive charge. And there are all sorts of other rules that we can go back and test by making new forms of matter. This is the synthesis strategy, right? Complements analysis, complements observation. If we couldn't go back and make these new forms of matter, we would have some problems actually trying to, uh, to get this uh, theory to be well grounded in our heads. I mean, there's a whole story which I won't tell, which you can read about in this paper by Daniel Hooter, where it turns out that some of these things, this is a donor, donor, acceptor, hydrogen bonding pattern on a small heterocycle, it turns out that some of those don't work very well because of a chemical instability, not, not a hydrogen bonding instability. And so we fix that by doing chemical changes. And we also had problems which you find in modern bases called tautomerization. This is where hydrogens move around spontaneously. You don't want to have hydrogen moving around in the molecule that you're using to have kids, especially if you're using those hydrogen bonds to tell what information goes into the kids. 
because moving hydrogens around changes the information. That's a mutation. We had one of these base pairs was extremely mutagenic. Ten percent of the time, it was causing a mutation, and ninety percent of the time only was it complementing the correct complement. And so we had to fix that. So you can see all sorts of ways in which synthesis is demonstrating this predictive manipulative control over base pairing using this sort of meta-language of organic chemistry. This is just another way of saying that our theory is good enough to create a DNA system with now an additional eight letters that watson crick base pairing really is pretty much as simple as shuffling hydrogen bond donors and acceptors back and forth within the context of size complementarity. And that was not the case, as I mentioned a moment ago, for the backbone. So our theory is good enough to understand the basis, but our theory is not good enough to understand the backbone. Um, and this has been terribly useful. I won't go through all the studies. If some of you have had HIV or hepatitis B or hepatitis C, you would uh, be one of the 400,000 patients last year that used this non-standard genetic information to help personalize health care. Now, um, the time has gone to sleep, I'm afraid, uh, your clock. But, uh, so let's see how we're doing with respect to time. Oh, okay, good. Well, one of the questions you then ask is, okay, great, that's the polyelectrolyte theory of the gene. But now the question is, well, can you get this artificial uh, genetic system to support Darwinian evolution? And, of course, at some point you're going to say, well, you can get it to support Darwinian evolution. Can you get it to support life? Um, one of our problems, of course, was that we did not have the stomach to create a brand new enzyme that would accept a genetic alphabet with 12 nucleotides different. The four that we already have plus the eight that we invented. Um, and furthermore, the natural polymerases um, that God or evolution has given us are well adapted for the four bases that we already have. And so we spent a lot of time trying to get DNA polymerases that would work with the expanded genetic alphabet with 12 letters in addition to the four. And it all came down to a focus on this green pair of electrons. So, um, this is an unshared pair of electrons. It's presented to the minor groove by both C and G, which are shown here. They're also presented by T, or in this case, uracil and A, in this case, amino A. And these unshared pair of electrons in the minor groove is a recognition spot for polymerases. And we had really only two choices. One was to change the amino acids that were looking for those green electrons in the minor groove, or to go to one of the synthetic pairs, which is this donor-donor acceptor hydrogen bonding pattern, which has a green pair of electrons on both the big component here and the small component there. Now, we've done both of these at this point, and, and, uh, um, and uh, that, that's the same slide. Um, so, so, and there's the recognition element. That's where most polymerases are looking for that unshared pair of electrons. And those are the amino acid residues in family A polymerases on the left and family B polymerases on the right that are actually looking for that green pair of electrons, some of which, um, some of the extra letters in the genetic alphabet that we have made don't have them. Here's one that does not. And some of them, of the extra letters in the genetic alphabet that we've made do have that green pair of electrons. So both strategies were followed, and I won't go to the details. This is a case where we're doing a Darwinian uh, evolution, actually, an artificial uh, uh, six-letter genetic system. Those are the six letters. Four of them are natural. Cytosine is natural, guanine is natural, thymine is natural, and adenine is natural. This pair is a pair of hydrogen bonding species that are a fifth and sixth letter of the genetic alphabet. If you look closely, the red and blue hydrogen bond donor and acceptor things are not at the same spots as they are here. There's not a green pair of electrons down where my laser pointer is. But we have engineered a reverse transcriptase um, that is doing this um, PCR type of amplification by replacing an amino acid at position 188 in a position, amino acid at position 478 to try to let the natural enzyme take these unnatural substrates. And it was from this that Philip Ball gave us this wonderful headline article, Enzyme Stitch Non-Natural DNA Guided Evolution Create Man-Made Stuff of Life. All right. Um, there were problems with this system as well. I've already mentioned about tautomerism. There's a um, work that we've done to 
allow six-letter PCR to manage that. And there's now a six-letter PCR that we have with the six letters being thiot instead of thymidine and uh, um, uh, 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 c ISIS-C, and ISIS-G, which are two additional letters. So this is a second example of a six-letter base pair. And that's what got me called an old-school synthetic biologist, meaning somebody who tries to um, come up with new genetic systems that work um, as a way of testing these basic questions, like how life got started on Earth, or what other forms it might it might take. There's still, for those of you who are interested, the uh, just to close the circle, we do have now a case where um, uh, we actually have done a six-letter PCR. This was just published last year, where there's an unshared pair of electrons, the green electrons in the minor groove, which is where the laser pointer is pointing right now. The other green pair of electrons is over here. Now, you can decide for yourself whether or not this system can undergo Darwinian evolution. We have in this paper, and you can look at this, the fact that we have polymerases that will amplify a six-letter genetic system where the fifth and sixth letters are these two bases. We have mutations. In fact, I'm sorry, base, this base over here and this base over here. What I've shown you here is the possibility of this system doing mutation. About 1% of the time, this guy, the funny small thing, will not find its appropriate partner, the funny big thing, but it will deprotonate, and if it deprotonates, it changes the hydrogen bonding pattern so that the complement for here is not the funny big thing, but rather natural G. And there's a mutation process that we can look in this system where G is replaced instead of that. And likewise, this guy every now and then will pair template opposite protonated C. These are mechanisms by which you can evolve this system and not only replace the two additional bases by the two standard bases, but also convert the two standard bases into the two additional bases. And you can see a system which can undergo um, the basis of point mutation. And well, keep in mind that Jerry Joyce did not talk about a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, which this certainly is. What he talked about was a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. What's absolutely clear right now is in order for this to undergo Darwinian evolution, you have to have a graduate student or a postdoc sitting there at every cycle, adding reagents, removing waste products, supporting the metabolism. And so the evolution of this particular system is slow, to say the least. So that's basically what we have to say. I mean, those are the four paths. I've obviously talked about the bottom and the right triangle in large part because I spent a lot of time on the other two triangles just a week ago for a conference that many of you were at. But with that, let me stop, um, uh, re summarize just by saying that, yes, you can go backwards in time to simpler life, but not to essential life. Um, it's really not all that clear that it's all that informative about what we think is necessary for the essence of life, although it's quite clear that Darwinian evolution is a very effective way of doing things. It may not be the only way, um, but certainly this is what drives us to construct artificial life in the laboratory with a target on chemistry and Darwin and not other things that we uh, may not, well, we have thought of and certainly reject, like vitalism, but certainly other things that we haven't necessarily thought of. But by setting this ambitious goal, the thought is that we're being dragged kicking and screaming across uncharted territory, where if we are unable to get emergent properties out of, say, in vitro selection experiments with a six-letter or eight-letter genetic alphabet, um, we're going to be missing something in our theory of life. And that's, of course, what the synthesis activity, the synthesis strategy is supposed to produce. So let me stop. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions I can receive. Okay, thank you, Steve. Let's all thank our speaker. Okay, uh, if you have a question, would you please raise your hand on WebEx, and I'll also give folks an opportunity to just jump in with questions. But while I've got the open mic here, let me just put in a plug, first of all, for the archives. Uh, if you would like to tell somebody about Steve's talk and they weren't able to hear it, it's going to be archived within a few days on the NAI website, and you'll be able to see Steve's face and uh, actually see everything except the laser pointer, which he used excellently, I must say. And unfortunately, that's the one thing that isn't present in the archive. But I think anybody who didn't see the talk and would like to will enjoy uh, being able to do it on the archive and, of course, all the other talks.
from this year are archived there as well. And let me also, while I have the open mic, just put in a plug for the next director seminar, which is going to be Giovanna Tinetti on June 2nd. And she's going to be talking about her work on uh, understanding the characteristics of extrasolar planets. And with that, Marco, do we have any hands raised on WebEx? We have a question from Goddard. Goddard, please go ahead. Uh, when you talk about the bases, you, uh, you say you use eight bases and then try to see if they work with the four bases we took as supernatural. Why do we, don't you have a system completely synthetic and with the eight bases you know, interacting between them without the four that we know? Well, yeah, that's a good question. The answer is because that's a lot more work. Right, adding two plus four that are natural that can be purchased from Sigma Aldrich and where the triphosphates are available from Trilink is a lot easier for any one graduate student or postdoc to do than to have the poor graduate student or postdoc have to make six triphosphates, which is actually the difficult synthesis. Um, making the nucleoside is one thing. Making the triphosphate is more difficult. So, that's the, so we have not, for example, done the pi DAD, that is the permitting with a donor acceptor donor in its complement, the pi AAD and the pi DA, which is the, is, uh, but that's only because what happens is one of these uh, base pairs gets assigned to one individual who has to make both components, right, and that's also enough work. The last thing that they want to do before I let them graduate is to make another pair of triphosphates and another pair of triphosphates. So that's the, that's the correct answer to your question. The question, of course, is whether or not it would be easier to come up with an artificial genetic system. There are reasons to believe that it would if we pitched aside the natural bases. And part of that reason is because the way in which the heterocycle is joined to the sugar, that there are three base pairs where the heterocycle is joined to the sugar by a carbon-nitrogen bond. And those are the four standard, the two standard base pairs plus one of the unnatural ones, and there are three that are joined by a carbon-carbon bond, there's reason to believe that uniformity would be easier to achieve in a high-fidelity genetic system. Unfortunately, all of the systems that are joined by carbon-carbon are the non-standard bases, which would require somebody to actually make them all at the same time. But, the, but that might very well be an easier system to implement. So there are reasons to think that the chemical properties, which are distributed unevenly across these 12 letters in the genetic alphabet, would we, we would be find it easier if we were to pick and choose in a way that does not include four standard and two non-standard. But just from the point of view of beating a poor graduate student into making them or right, a postdoc the same, and that's why we do it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We have a question from Colorado. Hi. Can you hear me, Steve? I can. Oh, good. This is Carol Cleland. I enjoyed your talk. I do <laughs> Hi, Carol. Hi. I have a question about using microbial paleogenetics to infer things about the earliest forms of life. I noticed you didn't talk about lateral gene transfer, which makes it, I understand, and perhaps I'm wrong about this, difficult to infer what the very earliest forms of life were uh, like, microbial life. And even more importantly, um, Darwinian evolution presupposes a complex cooperative arrangement among proteins and nucleic acids, and it's achieved uh, in life as we know it through ribosomes. And so Carl Woese and others have argued that, you know, whatever life came earlier couldn't have been able to do Darwinian evolution. There must have been some kind of a progenote, which he speculates might have done something like Lamarckian evolution. So I just wondered whether you view these as problems uh, for uh, the idea of microbial phylogenetics, uh, microbial paleogenetics. Yeah, I, I do, and they're big problems. First, I, I don't think it, I'm trying to avoid saying, I hope I did say that all that we were really doing was going back deep into the eubacterial tree, which is really all that we've done with the elongation factors. We actually are nowhere, well, I don't know how close we are. We're, we're, we're not at the last common ancestor of archaea and eubacteria, for example. Um, the, 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 the catch to that, of course, is that, as I mentioned, we haven't gotten into any sense a essential form of life. We still do rely on the, uh, on two things, actually. We rely on the definition of the tree, and here that tree is being really defined as the ribosomal tree, but it's really the elongation factor tree, right, which happens to have very nice congruence 
to the ribosomal tree. So we're not looking at least lateral transfer of, of, of elongation factors and their, their immediate co-substrates or coenzymes. But what, what is quite clear is that we do not necessarily um, have a speciation concept. We have defined basically the species tree as the elongation factor tree slash ribosome RNA tree. But look, one of the big questions about Darwinian evolution, frankly, and what we have not addressed, and I guess I was trying to say this, but I didn't say it effectively in the talk, so let me try to say it effectively now. And that is one of the big questions about whether or not life can be simply a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution is whether you do need to have both proteins and nucleic acids to have Darwinian evolution. So about seven years ago, we wrote a paper for, for a NASA book white paper where the argument was made that uh, we didn't have, uh, well, that a genetic molecule was going to have a hard time being a catalytic molecule, and a catalytic molecule was going to have a hard time being a genetic molecule. Why? Well, because a genetic molecule templates where a catalytic molecule folds, and a genetic molecule tries to have the same physical properties regardless of, a, of a building block substitution, whereas a catalytic prop molecule needs to have different properties as a function of building block substitution. And so all these things were because you had to have a property A for a genetic molecule and a property not A for the catalytic molecule and vice versa, it was actually very hard to conceive of molecular systems that could do both catalysis and genetics. That RNA, which has certainly the ability demonstrated to do both, was actually quite special in the world of biopolymers. It really is hard to find any other biopolymer that does a good job of both folding when it wants to and not folding when it doesn't want to, or changing in physical property when it wants to and not changing physical property when it wants to. And so the one essence of Darwinian evolution that is really missed right now, and it is missed for sure in this going backwards in time, is whether a single biopolymer can support Darwinian evolution. And so help me God, the answer to that question, which we found entirely satisfactory 20 years ago, was that yes, that molecule is RNA. It did so in early Earth. Problem solved. Okay, it's unfortunately not an acceptable answer 20 years later. Right now, we have had the most miserable time getting, well, I mean, obviously, Don Burke and various people, there, there's a large number of people, Jack Shostak, Jerry Joyce, have gotten catalysis out of nucleic acids. But it's been extremely difficult to get an RNA molecule that catalyzes at great length template directed synthesis of RNA. Pete Unrau and his student Hanny Zayer have come closest, or they've done the best job to date. Um, and it's been extremely difficult to find evidence out of the paradox that a genetic molecule must do X and a catalytic molecule must do not X. Further, when RNA wanders into a region of highly G-rich sequence space, it tends to fold. It doesn't tend to display rule-based molecular evolution anymore. So your question is spot on. We, where the big puzzle right now is between the molecular description of evolution, the essence of life, and then evolution as we know it in the modern world is whether or not what we get in the modern world can be gotten with a single biopolymer. I'd be a lot happier if, A, we could make RNA from prebiotic precursors in high yield. We can make it half-baked. I would be a lot happier if we can had an RNA molecule that with facility catalyzes the synthesis of RNA, especially if it had a complete cycle. I'd be a lot better, happier if we had a reasonable mathematical or theoretical description of how catalytic power is distributed within RNA sequence space. I'm sure any of you <laughs> have this? Go right ahead. Okay, there aren't any more hands raised, so if anybody would like to just jump in with a question, this is an opportunity to. Hi, Steve. It's Lisa Pratt. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in um, this, this sulfur-anchored backbone and wondering if you can, can say anything about what happens if you get away from, from circum-neutral pH conditions. If we were to think about uh, early evolution in a very acidic environment, can we uncouple ourselves from phosphate backbones? Yeah, yeah, but that's a very good question. Um, we, 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 there's a paper that we wrote for, again, one of these NASA things, which uh, discussed life at very low pH and life at very high pH. And it's, it's absolutely certain that you must get away from certain features of natural nucleic acids, standard nucleic acids, standard terran nucleic acids, if you wanted to go to higher acidity, for example, uh, 
certainly DNA doesn't do a very good job at high at high acidity. At low pH, the, the bases fall off of DNA, and this becomes a horrible mess of depurination and deprimidinylation. Um, it's an interesting question. In fact, it was the, it was the talk of, that I gave, I guess, with, with Andrew Poirier's session at the Abside conference as to whether you could get away with the repeating negative charge by having a repeating dipole where the positive ends of the dipole were all tucked inside the molecule and the negative ends are outside, so you sort of had an effective charge without, without having a net charge. And we were actually focused more on Titan as the place because there you have to go to high pH, you have to go to a more hydrophobic solvent, and you have to go to lower temperatures. And so the idea is, the short answer to the question is, of course, we don't know, but the speculation was that you could get away from this polyelectrolyte model for the backbone at low temperatures in hydrophobic solvents where you just couldn't tolerate. I mean, you can't dissolve a repeating charge in, in a solvent like methane uh, at any temperature. But the idea was, yes, you might be able to get away from it that way. The higher acidity um, conditions that you find in, in the solar system, like Venus, for example, are, of course, also very polar, so you wouldn't need to get away from um, the higher acidity. Uh, the, the need for repeating, I mean, sulfuric acid will dissolve a polyelectrolyte just fine, like it will dissolve most things. But then, of course, you really have to worry about the acid base properties and the acid stability of the of the uh, well, the acid base properties of the bases, paradoxically defined the nuclear bases. Um, and yeah, you know, we had proposed a whole number of C glycosides, carbon glycosides, which would be stable under Venusian atmosphere type pHs but they would still have the repeating negative charge in the backbone. You only really need to get away from that repeating charge if you go to a hydrophobic solvent like what you see on the surface oceans of Titan. Um, and then your problem is, frankly, that nothing dissolves at the temperatures of the surface oceans of Titan. That was the point that William Baines made in his talk at the Abside conference last week, that anything cold is a bad solvent, not because it's a bad solvent, just because it's cold. And, uh, and so... Uh, managing surface genetics, genetics in the ocean, surface oceans of Titan is going to be a problem. Steve, this discussion reminds me of a uh, talk at the last Origin of Life Gordon Research Conference in Ventura that was given by Felisa Wolf Simon, I think Ariel Anbar, and, and somebody else who may very well be on this net uh, were co authors. Uh, in which she was talking about the possibility of arsenic substituting for phosphorus. And I'm just wondering if these approaches of, of synthetic biology enable you to investigate the theoretical possibility of a system, which is fundamentally different in this other way or some other ways, for example, with arsenate substituting for phosphate. Well, I mean, as a good organic chemist, I would say not only is this strategy of synthesis a way of investigating that question, it's a, it's a necessary way of investigating that question. That is, there's no proposal for that hypothesis in the chemical community that will meet the chemist's standard of proof that will be acceptable to the chemical community all that is absent of an experiment where you try to make the DNA that contains arsenate in the backbone. And, and, of course, when Felicia first mentioned that to, to us and Paul, Paul Davies also, um, we uh, went out and tried. We tried to make some of it. And what we encountered for that specific example is, was actually chemistry of arsenate that's well known, and that is that the arsenate ester, unlike the phosphate ester, falls apart with half-lives of minutes in water at room temperature. The phosphate esters in DNA have half-lives of the water, well, 10 to the 15th seconds is what we are talking about that as 10 to the 13th minutes, not 1 to 5 minutes. So so the arsenate esters are orders of magnitudes, 10 to the 13th, that is, as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions and billions of times less stable than phosphate esters, meaning that it's really unlikely that you would have arsenate-based DNA in aqueous media at room temperature, at earth room temperature. But yeah, I mean, the point here is that you, you can't, you're not allowed in the chemistry community I mean, you're allowed in the planetary community, right, to propose a super-Earth, a very large, rocky Earth, without then going out and making one. Right? No one will complain to you and reject your paper because you did not make an Earth with a mass of five times the current Earth and test your theory on it. But in chemistry, if you propose a structure that you can draw on a sheet of paper, you have an obligation or you have to give up your union card to try to make it. In fact, it's worse than that. You almost have an obligation to make it. 
<laughs> you almost have an obligation to make it in the chemistry community before you publish the paper on it. So in this sense, the chemists have a very different way of approaching science than, than the planetary scientists or the astrophysicists who don't have to make a new star before they can publish a paper about how a star might look. Thanks, Steve. Uh, any further questions? Please just jump in if you have one. Okay, if not, then let's thank Steve again for a great talk.